Beller is a writer and a community organizer. His work has been published in the Minnesota Review, Fiction International, Arts and Letters, West Branch, Washington Square, and The Rumpus, as well as anthologies like Best Gay Erotica, 2006 and 2008. He's the co-editor of Horror After 9-11, forthcoming from the University of Texas Press. Check him out at samjmiller.com. Please welcome. This story is called Depression Half Production Costs. We're crouched low behind a bush in Madison Square Park, which, go figure, is nowhere near Madison Square Garden. Eventually, I'll ask Earl about it. Which one is the real Madison Square? He's 55 and has lived like every day of it here in the city. Point out any odd building or street name and he knows the backstory. For the moment, though, all I want from him is the fingers down my throat, the face pressing into the back of my neck. I want us totally naked, but it's December and freezing. When I get Earl's pants down, his crotch is slick with sweat, as is my own from all the layers we wear. The cold air invigorates us, and we fuck as freely and noisily as anybody who had a bedroom. No cops come through. You tire an old man out, he says, while we lie there balled up together. We breathe heavy, watching a steam in front of us. My head is cradled in his lap. I can smell him through all the layers. For two weeks, I've been stuck to him like glue. For a month before that, I've been chasing him through Marcus Garvey Park, sharing cigarettes, making my advances more and more advanced. Now I'm trying to shape the sense of him as a conquest, as something I saw and wanted and went for, because I'm starting to feel strongly about him, and I want him to feel the same, and that might be a tougher proposition. Afterward, he points to the Empire State Building. Did you know they built that in like a year? It was all set to start in 1929, but then the Great Depression came and cut the production costs in half. Because they could pay people half as much, I say. Exactly. That was the beginning of New York's homeless problem. It's like the pyramids. This architectural marvel was totally dependent on the misery of slave labor. No safety harnesses up there. Did you know six workers died in the course of building it? We sit on a bench on the north side of the park. It's a Sunday night. 26th Street is quiet, except for one building people keep going into. Must be a party, Earl says, pointing to the fifth floor where people stand smoking on a balcony or maybe a veranda. Earl would know the difference. More and more people go in, mostly young, handsome men. I'm picturing something gay, a magazine launcher, a graphic designer ball. Let's crash it, I say, the party. Are you kidding? I'll stick out like a sore thumb. Not only will I be the only black guy, I'll be the only guy over 40. It might be more diverse than you think, I say. I think I just saw a South Asian guy go in. And I bet there's an open bar and trays of expensive food. It'll be nice to get out of the cold. Earl nods. We get up, cross the street, join a straight couple going in. Fifth floor, asks the girl when the elevator door shuts. Where else, Earl asks, flashing the smile that got my attention right off the bat. When the doors swing open on the fifth floor, there's such a crush of people, no one sees us slip in, hang up our coats, head for the booze. The macaroni and cheese is crusted in one of those fancy cheeses I've seen in supermarkets and always wondered about. I've shoveled five spoonfuls into my mouth without chewing when a girl comes up to me and says, you and I must be the youngest people here. Must be, I said, grinning, thinking fast. I'm Solomon. I'm Maggie, do you work here? No, I don't even know what this place is. My boyfriend got invited by somebody who works here. Yeah, a friend asked me to come along. Must be a hell of a place to have, to make, to have a space this big. I know, right? What do you suppose they pay in rent? Earl's right, he can't blend. I try not to leave him alone for too long, but I'm enjoying the way I can move into and out of conversations. The guy at the bar doesn't card me when I ask for a martini. I've never had one before. The name reeks of power. Men cruise me. I'm tempted to try for phone numbers just to see if I can. Because I'm young, my ragged sleeves scream fashion, not pauper. <laughs> we could go all week and never get a chance to use a bathroom like that, Earl says, when he comes out of it. Breath mints and lube and condoms and a bidet. I'm not joking about the bidet. Puts even Grand Central to shame. In the back are a series of offices. Earl scopes them out, beckons, beckons me from the cushiest one. From the business cards on top of a somehow fabulous filing cabinet, we figure out the office belongs to Lucia Stevenson, who's the executive director of Krell and Stevenson, which presumably is where we're at. Lucia has one of those expensive swivel chairs, which I sit Earl in. The room smells of money. I kneel between his legs, unzip him, pull both pairs of pants and his thermals and his boxer shorts to mid-thigh. He's only half hard and I stare until it swells all the way out, pointing lazily past the top of my head. 
As he stroked the top of my head, I unbuttoned shirt after shirt, letting him out of my mouth at the end of it to pull my thermal undershirt over my head. We're really going all the way, Earl says, when I stand up and take his shirts off too. For a second, I'm confused. We've already done everything imaginable. Then I realize we've never been naked together before. Lucia could walk in at any moment. Let her, it's her office. I sit on him, my back to him, facing the door to the office and the hallway and the party. With his hands on my sides, he lifts me up, pulls me in, his hands holding in place and his hips dart in and out. Lean back, he whispers, and I do, pushing him back, pushing my shoulder to his chin, floating in space in that fancy darkened office in this ghost world of graphic designers and expensive hors d'oeuvres where we don't belong, where we are the ghosts that haunt the house. Earl asks, do you think she'd be madder that we crashed her party or that we got jizz all over her desk? <laughs> I'm wiping it up, but I think some got in between the keys of her keyboard. No one comes anywhere near and all the time it takes us to stop kissing and get all 50 layers of clothes back, in, back on. I take my martini glass back into the crowd. I don't feel bad about taking advantage of Krell and Stevenson hospitality. In fact, I'm feeling sort of smug and contemptuous about them. All the money that flows through that office, whatever the fuck they do, letting me steal their food and fuck my boyfriend is the least they can do. Earl's in the bathroom and I'm waiting for the elevator. I overhear a queenie boy in horn rimmed glasses say to someone else, who let the homeless guy in? My face turns red with shame and then I realize they're not talking about me.